Hello, I'm super excited to have you here today. My name is Sharia Namvar and I'm responsible for the passive keyless entry solutions as well for the sub gigahertz IoT solutions within NXP. And the today's topic is the sub gigahertz uh, IoT topic and we will have a virtual conversation now and want to reflect on the low power wide area network with very specific focus on the 0G uh, network of Zigfox. And to get the greatest insights here, I want to uh, welcome here the CEO of Zigfox, Jeremy Prince, the CRO of Zigfox, Glenn Robinson, as well as the leading product manager for NXP Sub Gigahertz Solutions, Thomas Lorbach. Before driving now into the interesting topic and uh, really uh, going to a hopefully lively discussion, I would uh, appreciate if everybody introduces himself quickly and maybe Jeremy, you go first. Thank you very much and thanks for hosting this, this discussion. We're very excited to have a chat with you guys too. To start with the least impor important part of it all myself, I'm Jeremy Prince. I've uh, done most of my career in media and tech industries. Um, it's part of floating also two companies along the line. And uh, funnily enough, my, my previous job before uh, joining uh, Sigfox was COO of a company that produced animation movies. So I don't know what the link could be uh, with Sigfox, except that it's very tech oriented. And I joined uh, Sigfox three years ago as uh, chief strategy officer, then moved for two years in Dallas to USA to lead the subsidiary here and uh, was appointed CEO of Sigfox about four months ago, moving back to Europe, actually in the middle of it. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Glenn. Thank you, Sherry. Also delighted to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, I think Jeremy's being a little bit humble. Um, he's also been personally involved in um, taking two companies to IPO, uh, which we fully believe is going to be a big benefit to us. My role at Sigfox, I'm responsible for global sales and marketing. Um, and before that, I worked for a global system integrator for many years called Dimension Data. It's now NTT, where um, our focus was on global system integration and uh, delivery of services to large enterprise customers. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Thomas. Yes, hello. thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Lorbach. I'm product manager at NXP Semiconductors. Uh, as Shaya mentioned, I'm responsible currently for the sub gigahertz RF portfolio. That's automotive and non-automotive. And uh, I've been literally for 20 years almost now uh, in the wireless area, uh, supporting activities and engineering activities with Bluetooth, uh, Zigbee, ultra wideband and now I'm taking care of our sub gigahertz portfolio. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, to myself, only briefly, so from a historical perspective, I was working as an engineer, analog and digital design. Uh, then I took care about NFC solutions, secure element uh, solutions, as well as uh, UHF devices or in general RFID products. And uh, recently, or the last five, six years, taking care about automotive products as well as uh, the sub gigahertz IoT topics and here in specific Zigfox. So thank you guys for taking your time being here today with us. Uh, and uh, Jeremy, since we are now uh, roughly, I think four months as a CEO of Zigfox, uh, it's really the interesting point here to get first-hand information from you. And therefore I'm really looking forward to see what your view on bit history and a bit future is at the end of the day and how we can cooperate on certain uh, activities together. So my first question would be somehow if you can tell us briefly about the Zigfox journey and uh, what it is from your perspective up to date. Thank you, with pleasure. So as I said, I, I joined uh, Zigfox three years ago. Uh, but the journey started way before that because Sigfox was created about 10 years ago. Uh, it was a small startup in, in La Berge in the south of France. And I like to say that what really attracted me initially to Sigfox is the, the disruptive idea that, you know, we're in a, in a phase where everyone is all about more. More data, more 
more throughput, more less less latency, but more instantaneous. Uh, and, and the idea behind Sigfox is in a way that uh, less can also be more. And you don't need to build a motorway to ride a bicycle. And, and basically with little small messages, because a, a Sigfox message is 12 bytes, uh, and, and a limited message is a number of messages per day, you can already achieve a lot. And with those small limitations come a lot of, ad of advantages that allow you uh, to, to be positioned in, in IoT segments that would have been difficult to address in, in such a way otherwise. So there were three phases in, in, in the Sigfox history, basically. I'd say there was a first phase that, like in every tech-oriented company, was really technology-driven. So establishing, working around the technology with with this engineers taking the lead. I shouldn't say that on a call where everyone is, is an engineer except me. Uh, and, and that was the really important phase, establishing this, this best-in-class technology. Then we, we moved to a second phase because something that's very unique also about Sigfox is that we, we're the only IoT uh, player that has, um, I'd say, uh, worldwide, to be honest, it's 72 countries, but it, it's a, a good chunk of the world. Uh, we've got a network in 72 countries, a seamless network, thanks to our Sigfox operators in, in those different countries. And uh, it was a very important part of our journey, building those relationships with those Sigfox operators so that they can deploy the network in, in the country. And um, in the countries, sorry. And then we are moving now because, as you probably know, and you've probably acknowledged yourself, the IoT market took longer than the analyst expected to take off. But what we can see is that really now it's taking off. We, we see it with the volumes, we see it with the type of companies that are moving into the space and embracing the technology. And we now are moving into what we call the connectivity phase. And this is the expansion of connected devices with numbers that are growing year on year and, and reaching millions, soon hundreds of millions. And, uh, and it's really the exciting phase because from day one, Sigfox was designed for massive IoT. So we're, we're happy to see it happen at last. Yeah, thanks for this explanation, Jeremy. So I believe on NXP side, we have a similar view when it comes to new technologies and how they um, yeah, get into the market and at the end of the day, get really popular. Let's uh, phrase it like that. Uh, therefore, I think a very important point is uh, to understand uh, what the value proposition of uh, Zigfox is. I think what you partially um, gave a hint to it, but I think there is much more to it. And specifically when we look into uh, competing technologies or parallel technologies, however we want to phrase it, narrowband IoT or LoRa, for example, can you maybe in a brief and simple way explain to us uh, how you would judge that? As I said, I, I am the only one here almost that's not an engineer, so it will have to stay brief and simple. Uh, I would, I would summarize, summarize it in, in, in my own words. And it's not about that much about comparing. And, and Honestly, I think that the, the IoT market, the potential of the market is, is, is absolutely tremendous. And, and it's divided in, in sub-segments. And you need to match the right technology with the right segment based on its benefits and its limitations. If you look at Sigfox, we have got a, a, a very frugal, simple and robust technology. It's, it doesn't use uh, a, a lot of energy. It's the, 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 the technology that uses the less energy uh, to send a message. Same thing for our for our network, I, I was talking with a, the, the founder that was saying that uh, one 5G antenna uses as much energy than the whole Sigfox network in France. So that's to illustrate how, how frugal our, our technology is from the network point of view, but it's also the same from, from a device point of view. And it's very important when you're looking into massive IoT. Um, we're very simple. Also, I insisted on the robust, and that's all the anti-jamming, etc., 
uh, part of, uh, of our technology, but the simple is also very important. We own and operate the network through our Sigfox operators, so collectively with our Sigfox operators that own an, in every country. And that means that for a, for a customer, there's no need to configure their own, to deploy their own network. It's really plug and play. When you, you've got your, your Sigfox enabled device, you turn it on and it immediately starts communicating. And the beauty also of the 72 countries is that it communicates in the same way wherever you are. So let's take the example of a, a container that you can track using Sigfox. It will send the data exactly in the same way to the same cloud and be accessed by the customer in the same way, where whether it's in the port, the port of Louvre in France or the port, port of Houston down the road from when, where I am or any port in, in Asia. And, and that is also key. So I think that the, the, the frugal side of our technology, the simple side of our technology, and I insist on, on this network that doesn't request infrastructure, setting up infrastructure for the customer, et cetera, it's really plug and play. And, and the fact that it's robust and uses also little energy uh, means that on top of being plug and play, we like to say it's deploy and forget you can leave your, your, your device for a long time. And why is it important? Because when you're talking about customers that are going to deploy hundreds of thousands, millions of devices, uh, deploying them can actually be a huge hassle and a huge cost. And maintaining them, just going and changing a battery when you're multiplying that by hundreds of thousands is also a huge hassle and a huge hidden cost. So. I don't like to compare, but I like to focus on, 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 on the really pros of our, of our technology and what makes us best in class, we believe, on identified segments such as tracking, where is my asset, or monitoring in what state is my asset, in a way. And with this additional layer underneath that our, our technology is particularly resilient, especially when it comes to jamming and things like that. So, as a security uh, layer that's also important for, for our customers. That's almost as technical so, as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so that's perfect. I think uh, it gives a good overview at the end of the day to understand really the bigger picture and the overarching value. So I think uh, very nice explained. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. And um, Sherry, if I can just build on um, something that um, Jeremy said, so we could assume that IoT is going to be a light bulb connected to some form of smart home device. Um, but our frame of reference is somewhat different uh, because those assets both have power, they're both static, it's fairly straightforward. Imagine now that you are a postal trolley or you are one of a million postal trolleys traveling across six different countries where you have a lifespan of seven odd years. Um, you have no power or no access to power. You're thrown out into the field of operation where there's a very good chance you're hardly ever going to be encountered again. Um, and Sigfox is all about digitizing those assets. That's the frame of reference that we assume is massive IoT. Or imagine a, a cool box transporting pharmaceutical vials or potentially in the future digitizing the vial itself with its location and its expiry date. That's massive IoT. That's the digital asset we want to digitize at Sigfox. That's the massive IoT that is our frame of reference and what we are pitching at. You say it so much better than me, Glenn. Uh, and, and, and I think this, this wouldn't be possible, of course, if we couldn't rely on, on, on strong partners in our ecosystem. Once again, we don't we don't manufacture a device, we, we, we connect them to our network and, and, and without companies such as NXP that's uh, always been a very important partner to Sigfox and, and from the beginning, I think we were talking about the other day about certification happening, the first certification in 2015 or something like that. If I may, I would like to ask you the question, Sherry, what has attracted NXP to this partnership with Sigfox? Um, so I think the uh, 
main reasons uh, both of you, Jeremy and Glenn, you already gave. So I think a lot of values that Zigfox brings to the table are already mentioned and I would like to um, maybe link it a bit to the portfolio of NXP and where NXP plays from a connectivity perspective. I believe that NXP is always a front runner when it comes to new technologies because you were mentioning, uh, Jeremy, this hype cycle of emerging technologies at the end of the day that takes always longer than expected. This is valid for most of the newly introduced uh, yeah, IC solutions systems at the end of the day. And uh, NXP has a pretty long history when it comes to connectivity. When we think, for example, about MyFair technology, what is today in most of the larger cities in the world for ticketing systems um, introduced and used, uh, the NFC solutions, which are nowadays in each and every mobile phone, and uh, the most prominent use case is the contactless payment, I think everybody knows. Uh, then the latest innovation is ultra wideband, uh, where at the end of the day, it will get as well in each and every phone and uh, this technology then enables that we have seamless entrance uh, possibilities into our home, offices, cars and so on. Then there is Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. So all these technologies together um, have exactly what Glenn described now. And I, my personal belief and uh, in NXP how we judge it, uh, Zigfox is perfectly complementing these solutions. So. With Zigfox on board, I would say we have a complete portfolio uh, serving more or less everything, I want to say. And from that perspective, I think it's excellent. Uh, the other point is that uh, what you mentioned at the beginning, the 0G network, which is rolled out worldwide. This is, uh, I must say, really impressive how your team at the end of the day managed to do such a thing. Uh, and get to this incredible worldwide coverage. It's, I think it's not a easy thing. Uh, after it's done, maybe some people say, yeah, so what? But uh, I believe until you get there and you have it there, um, I think it's really something, a really good achievement, a great achievement, I want to say. And then when we combine it now with the um, NXP sub gigahertz hardware and software solution, that means our OL devices, uh, where we will talk a bit later on about it, I think. Uh, there we see then that the low power capabilities of our device, including your uh, Zigfox technology, including the network uh, coverage worldwide, really make their battery efficient uh, uh, solutions available. And especially with the availability of the zero G network, uh, it enables and makes fast to solution um, uh, enablement somehow. It enables really a solution for the customer. Uh, as you said, you open the box and in an ideal case, immediately it's done. Uh, there's a bit more to it, it's clear, but at the end of the day, if we put these systems together, I believe we will get to that point. And this uh, is then a scalable solution and this leads really to this massive IoT topic we were talking about. So all in all, I believe we can heavily compare it with the RFID situation, for example, coming from the 90s into the beginning of the 2000s, where everybody every year were promising more and more and more. But when we look now in this last decade, in the, in the 2010s, then we see that really the RFID solutions picked up. And this was the reason because the infrastructure, cloud uh, networks, uh, pricing structure, uh, cost structure, uh, cost of ownership of the devices and solutions was in a range that it really enabled a lot of uh, applications and solutions. And therefore, I'm totally with you, Jeremy, when you say that we are now really in the productivity phase coming out of this hype cycle of emerging uh, technologies. And uh, we see this massive IoT uh, definitely happening, not only with Zigfox, but in general in the industry. So I'm personally looking forward uh, that we are part of this uh, largely uh, developing ecosystem. Um, Sherry, I've got a question and, and the question is probably best directed at um, Thomas. Uh, you guys are exposed to all manner of wireless technologies. Um, so how would you compare Sigfox technology um, and where we fit in the market? Um, and how would you compare us to some of the other wireless protocols that you guys are um, currently exposed to? Yeah, I guess um, the real answer is it's a little bit difficult to, to really compare it. If you, 
if you go and, and check out NBIoT, that's much high data rate. Uh, the power consumption is, is much higher. Uh, we've got two-way communication. We need to negotiate a channel. Uh, that's not a challenge that we are having with Sigfox. With Sigfox, we just send the message off and trust that it is being received by a base station. And that's basically it. It's connectionless. It's some people would refer to it as an Aloha principle, right? Where you just shout out and it moves. Um, in particular, this is beneficial, of course, for any sort of tracking um, applications. In reality, if you imagine, for example, any goods that are on a, on a truck moving at 50 miles, 80 kilometers an hour over the countryside, and if you then have got a technology that needs a connection to establish first and negotiate a channel and whatever, that can be actually quite hard and very power consuming uh, on the individual device, right? So in, in terms of frugal, you know, from, from a protocol perspective, um, it's very low data, it's, it's 12 byte payload. Um, it doesn't really compare uh, to any other technologies that we're having. I mean, BLE, that's short range, Wi-Fi, this is just covering the home, that's not really low power wide area, uh, network technology, um, NB-IoT, as I said, um, if nodes and assets are fixed, that's quite good um, for supply chain, probably not so much. Uh, then there's a second component to it, which is related to cost, um, very simply speaking. Um, we, we do see that there is a little bit of overlap also with LoRaWAN technology, right? Um, but with Zigfox, we've got the benefit here that we've got, you know, automotive sub gigahertz portfolio. These are standard transceivers, uh, have been around for many years. And we can take them off the shelf and apply a Zigfox library to it and, and basically wrap it up as a total product. And, and it's going to work, right? Um, with other technology, we potentially would have the challenge of IP licensing. Um, there's royalties to be paid. Uh, these are not off the shelf. It's a single supply. Um, so that's also playing in the hands of Zigfox, really, in terms of frugal, in terms of cost. It's standard components that can be made to work with Zigfox. And, uh, and they are available in the millions, right? And um, so that, that's to be taken into account, right? And uh, just so that people have an understanding of low power, um, we've designed a tag um, that is currently running off a CR2450 battery. So that's a 500 milliamp hour battery. And what we are seeing at eight messages a day um, that we get about five to eight years of lifetime of it. For many products, that is obviously above their own lifetime. So it will be basically the service will be available over the whole time um, of product life. And um, so that has to be taken into account. And then if we think about it, uh, out of this coin cell, we are sending messages over a range of 10 to 30 kilometers, <laughs> um, which is spectacular, actually. <laughs> it's really great. Um, we, we've tested it um, in Hamburg, uh, good coverage. Um, we are really pleased with it and it's very low power compared to all the other things that we are having. And it enables new use cases uh, that we've not seen before. And um, from our receiver and transmitter perspective, um, I mean, you know, most people have a key fob for their car, right? And, and I guess most of these people would agree that you don't have to change the battery every year or two. Um, personally, I've got an older RKE system, they call it remote keyless entry. So that's with the push button uh, to open and, and close the car. The car is now seven years old. Um, I think I've changed on one of the keys, the battery ones. So, and this is what we are comparing against with Sigfox. We, we should be getting into the same space of lifetime um, compared to these remote key fobs uh, that we are using in the automotive industry. And therefore, it's a perfect fit for us. Uh, Thomas, you are uh, very, very lucky we're in COVID isolation. 
because if we weren't, I would be inclined to give you a big hug right now and a, and a kiss on the left cheek. Your ability to articulate our value is better than our own. <laughs> it's my pleasure, though. <laughs> okay. So I think the important uh, thing is at the end of the day, definitely the power consumption here. And uh, when we take it and compare it with key fobs and uh, similar devices, we talk here really microamps of uh, continuous current flowing. So it's really minimum, minimum uh, what is technically feasible, let's say, for this type of product. So I think we are at the edge and we can do definitely nice things with this technology. Yes, and, and to your point... That's really great. To, to your point, Shari, I, I think based on what we were saying earlier and thanks for articulating it that well Thomas it's it's really part of this uh, plug and play is one thing but deploy and forget is another thing and what you were saying about the the, the lifetime of the battery uh, being longer than the the actual lifetime of, of the device is key because for one key for your car you can be okay changing the battery once a year or two years it's just one but think of hundreds of thousands out in the open, it becomes a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, whilst we're, we're talking about all the other technologies, right? Um, I mean, if we are looking at very various use cases, and um, very often we find that Zigfox is actually a good complementary uh, technology to some of this, right? Um, if you look, for example, LTEM, NBIOT, there is jammers available that you can buy for 100 bucks somewhere in the internet. Um, it is, um, from our point of view, extremely difficult, if, if not impossible with today's generators or whatever, uh, to really uh, jam a Zigfox node. Uh, because it's not dependent on receiving, as I said, it's not a two-way communication. So jamming always means basically bringing enough e entry energy into the receiver, but the receiver isn't really bothered uh, by any of this because we are just transmitting, right? And then if you want to jam a Zigfox base station, then you have to send five, six people off the road to find those Zigfox base station and take every single one <laughs> under RF uh, fire, right? Uh, so that, that's going to be difficult. So use cases are, for example, uh, alarm systems, right? Where you've got a, um, an MBIOT radio and you can basically uh, put a Zigfox note next to it. And in case of an alarm, you shoot off the message and you're making sure that, you know, there's nobody intruder trying to just jam the NBIOT and, and gets the job done with any, without anybody noticing it, right? So um, that's something uh, that needs to be said. Um, the other thing is um, looking at, for example, Wi-Fi. We can use Wi-Fi technology to do the location improvement, right? So we're looking for SSIDs, we send them over the Zigfox network and basically Google Cloud and, you know, all the other services that are available, they are giving us a an indication on the map plus minus 100 meters, something along those lines. So it's also complementary to uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth low energy with the BI beacons that, that's also uh, being used for indoor location. Uh, that information can be made use of um, with the Zigfox network. So it goes basically hand in hand. Um, NXP, NFC technology, that's a customer user interface, right? Tap onto the Zigfox node, it sends off a message or it enables a function. You could take a bicycle lock, for example, you can tap it, it closes. As soon as somebody tampers with it, Zigfox sends off a message. Um, th there's a, a billion of use cases in reality uh, where we can complement uh, our existing uh, product portfolio of those various wireless and non-wireless technologies, also with microcontrollers and whatever. Um, with the Zigfox technology, right? And, and that's for us uh, basically one of the big things uh, about Zigfox, and that's why we bought into it in 2015. You should be careful, Thomas. Glenn is going to want to kiss you again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, all in all, I think... Uh, when we look now into the strategical topics, I think Jeremy, uh, Glenn, uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, many things became clear. 
Thomas, I think technically, uh, yes, I'm sure that we can discuss hours and hours about it because there is a lot to talk about, I think. Um, coming quickly maybe back to the strategy because, Jeremy, you mentioned uh, the zero G network, the coverage worldwide. I think one important point is definitely uh, as well US. And there would be interesting to understand how the network extension is planned or what ideas are behind it. Yes, of course, with, with, with pleasure. And, and maybe just in, in a nutshell to, to go back to, to where we stand and one, where we want to go. I think we, we've covered, thanks to, to Thomas, a lot of the, uh, the advantages and, and a lot of insight in the technology. Um, as I said, we have got a, a unique network. I think it's not only unique in the IoT world, but I think even in the telecom world, no one has managed to have this, uh, this seamless uh, worldwide network. Um, and and uh, I'd say so. We're, we're in a pretty good place as the as the race is is, is accelerating and, and massive IoT is taking off. Uh, got this technology, this unique platform. We've got this this network, in, in this zero G network. Uh, what we need to do now to, to continue uh, running and, 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 and run even faster is with partners such as NXP, we, we need to continue fostering innovation. Uh, we need to continue moving towards uh, a, a, a platform that can, uh, can absorb higher and higher volumes in, in hundreds of millions and, if, and soon billions of messages. Uh, we need to continue our journey together towards the, the, the ultra low cost to open more possibilities and, 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 and the, to increase the size of, of the market. We need to accelerate network deployment, although we're already in 72 countries. Some countries still need to, to expand the, the network, and, and we'll get back to the US specifically in a second. But um, we need to work with our Sigfox operators that are in every country and own and operate the, the network in every country to see how we can help them uh, develop further the, the network and the coverage. Um, and. and as part of, of this, and that was your question on the on the US, um, where we stand in the US is from day one, Sigfox did not intend to own and operate uh, the network in the countries. We have this sort of dual approach in a way where we're, we're a global technology, Sigfox, so we're global and we've got employees all across the world and, and messages arrive from all across the world. But we also believe in local, and, and our Sigfox operators in the countries are local. They know the, the, the local players. Uh, they know where and how to deploy in this country. They know also from a local go-to-market, because we, all, we, we quite often refer to, to Sigfox as Sigfox Corp. Uh, but we mustn't forget that it's a whole ecosystem of Sigfox operators across the world, and it's... Uh, it's something over 80 offices across the world. It's 2,200 employees when you put them all together. So it's, it's more firepower. But at the same time, still with this local touch on, on top of the global touch. Um, and, and the US, we had made the choice at the time for Germany, France and the US due to time to market decisions to, to start directly. So we didn't go through the extensive phase of finding the right Sigfox operator at the time because it takes time. And we decided we're going to start it directly. And when the, 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 the market matures, uh, it will always be time to go back to our core strategy and find a local Sigfox operator. That's what happened last year in Germany. So we were thrilled with, uh, with the sale of Germany to Iliot and, and Q, the infrastructure fund, so Idiot being or an existing Sigfox operator in other countries, because that gives the means to Sigfox Germany to accelerate in the country. Uh, when the market is picking up, this is when you've got to get all your ducks in a row, go back to your core strategy. So we've done it in Germany, and we're currently in, in, um, in the same type of process for France and the USA, to go back to your question, because the USA, as my Texan colleagues like to say, Texas is already bigger than France. Uh, it, it's a huge continent. So now that we, we are around uh, 
a third of the population covered and four to five percent of the territory. But we think by bringing in the right local SIGFOX operator with the right kind of backing, that will enable us to accelerate from a coverage point of view, but also from a sales point of view with, with more firepower locally. So there's been a good job done, but there's still a lot to do in the US due to the size of the country. And, um, and talking about accelerating, and I'm mixing different answers there, but um, we were talking about our, our, our strategy, so foster an innovation, accelerate network deployment, the two, two strong first points, and um, US being part of the second. And the third, I believe, is accelerate connectivity, accelerate adoption. As I said, we rely on SIGFOX operators in, in the different countries, but we have also got our, our own team that's led by Glenn, uh, and maybe Glenn, you can explain further, but the, the role of, of, of Glenn's team is to, to accelerate connectivity, and in two ways. We have got a, they're also a dual approach after global and local here. It's what we call pull and push. So push is more traditional, is supporting the SIGFOX operators, and Glenn will, will explain now to replicate, to expand. And, 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 um, and pull is where we engage uh, directly with some customer to foster some deals on some given segments. And maybe, Glenn, you can give a bit more details, a bit more flavor on that, and uh, some of the things that we've already achieved and some of the, the, the customers and wins we've, we've already got. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so um, earlier, Thomas touched on the architectural advantages or differentiators that we have with our technology. Jeremy touched on our operating model where we have global scale, global network, but with our Sigfox uh, operator partners, we also have local customer intimacy um, and market intimacy. Um, so how do we address our go-to-market strategy? Well, the first thing we have to remember is we are a disruptor. We're not a a mobile giant. Uh, we don't have the balance sheet. So we have to be very, very focused and we have to really play to our strengths. So we talk about our the way we address the market is push and pull. So with push, here our Sigfox operators and their channel partners supported by Sigfox will typically push value and solutions to the customer base. And we, we are strong in three areas, three solution areas typically. Asset tracking, where, for example, with customers like DPD, DHL, we've got nearly a million postal trolleys already digitized in production. Then we've got monitoring, um, which is typically static assets. And an example there would be Nichigas in Japan and Taiwan, where we are very close, as, again, to a million gas uh, meters already digitized in production. And then the third area is security, where our anti-jamming capability makes us quite unique for stunner vehicle recovery, recovery and home alarm. With home alarms, for example, we've got over two and a half million homes already connected with uh, VeriSure, Secure Test Direct. And that's where we push those to the market. But then we also look at a pull strategy where we've identified very specific vertical industries where we believe we can add unique value, working very closely with strategic partners like NXP, where we can build out industry specific whole solutions and address those industries. So for example, automotive, supply chain logistics, uh, postal services, breweries, um, and home alarm and stolen vehicle recovery of verticals where Sigfox Corp will engage and market directly, create demand, and then bring that demand back into our channel and Sigfox operators. Yes, and, and I'd add that the benefit also of having this global and local approach is that within the community of Sigfox operators, there are also wins that are that we can try to help the community of Sigfox operators replicate in other countries. So we, we're always learning a lot from those local experiences and it benefits the whole ecosystem. Okay, I think uh, we have as well to look a bit on the time. Uh, so I shall do somehow the timekeeping here, I believe. So therefore, I would like to uh, quickly sum up and uh, uh, at least take uh, one conclusion. I believe uh, where we all um, have a similar view on it. So at the end of the day, uh, this IoT market is picking up. Uh, this I think we all see. We see it in the industry, the analysts uh, as well uh, 
clearly state that and everybody is seeing it with different technologies in place. Uh, that means as well, uh, ZigFox will play there definitely a role. And uh, specifically, when we now look into the bigger picture, we always talk here about IoT, so Internet of Things. But uh, when we are honest, we must include processes, data, and very important people. So they connect it. At the end of the day, we talk then about the Internet of Everything and not only Internet of Things. So everything is here included in this Internet. And therefore, I personally believe that uh, specifically ZigFox with this worldwide uh, network and as you explained it now nicely Jeremy having it uh, local but uh, distributed worldwide so everything so this really fits to this idea of internet of everything and uh, the example you brought for example Thomas or Glenn uh, connecting different industries that means using today RFID combining it then with ZigFox um, and creating such a really seamless uh, way of communication and keeping track of all the goods and everything in the market. So I think that's really the thing that is happening. And when this massive IoT happens, and we all believe it is happening, in parallel it shows and accelerates the digital transformation everybody is always talking about. So you need all these things that the digital transformation happens. So I personally believe all these things are happening and therefore I'm uh, looking really forward uh, in all the engagements, activities we are driving here, uh, the things we are driving jointly from a product perspective, uh, really looking forward to enable here a lot of uh, new products, ideas, applications, and creating value for many people in this world and uh, our customers at the end of the day. So therefore, I would like to thank everybody here uh, for really this lively discussion. I think uh, uh, everybody who listened in observed that we could talk for hours, I believe. <laughs> everybody has a lot, <laughs> a lot to say here and explain and uh, listen to the, each other's experience. So looking forward to next activi joint activities and uh, wishing you all a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing the, the chat. Thank you indeed. Thank you.